Um, so I'm Ann Hertzberg, I'm the Legal Advisor of NGO Monitor, and I'd like to welcome you today to our webinar on the apartheid charge in historical context. And it's great to see so many of you have joined us from all over the world. And before we get started, I just want to plug two reports that I and my co-author Joshua Kern have published on the apartheid charge and which, which were the impetus for this webinar today. And I will put these links into the chat uh, so you can take a look at them if you have not already seen them. And I'll also include a link to NGO Monitor's webpage on the apartheid issue, where you can find links to relevant articles and information on government funding for NGOs involved in the apartheid campaign. So after a short introduction and uh, the discussion with our panelists, we hope we'll have some time for some Q&A from the audience. So please enter your questions in the Q&A box. Okay. So uh, for the past year and a half, we have seen an increase in NGO reports and media stories providing these reports with significant coverage, proclaiming Israel is imposing an apartheid regime of domination and oppression against the Palestinians, and that this regime and the inhumane acts alleged to be committed under it constitute a crime against humanity. And the predominant narrative in these stories and repeatedly pushed by the NGOs and their supporters is that until last year, the charge of apartheid was merely confined to the margins of radical politics and Palestinian civil society. But now as their claim goes, the conflict has supposedly changed so significantly that Israeli NGOs like B'Tselem and Yeshdin and quote, mainstream international NGOs like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty and UN officials such as UN Rapporteur Michael Link, who a couple of weeks ago issued a report echoing and heavily citing the NGO reports, could no longer remain silent. In reality, however, the invocation of apartheid discourse in the Arab-Israeli context is not new at all and has fluctuated in intensity over the course of seven decades. Early iterations of this discourse were present during the mandate period and were invoked by Arab representatives at various commissions and investigations all the way through the crafting of the UN partition plan in 1947. And in the 1960s and 70s, the Soviets heavily promoted this language as part of its anti-Zionist propaganda. Beginning in 2001 at the UN Durban conference, NGOs claiming the mantle of human rights took the baton from states and became the primary disseminators of the apartheid campaign. The same small group of organizations and individuals responsible for crafting the messaging of this campaign has remained largely static over the past 20 years. So what has changed and why have we seen this resurgence? Essentially, in February 2021, the pretrial chamber of the International Criminal Court, in a controversial two-to-one opinion, decided that the prosecutor had jurisdiction to open an investigation of Israel and the crime against humanity of apartheid is one of the potential crimes found in the court's Rome statute. Secondly, in May of 2021, two UN bodies, the UN Human Rights Council and the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination impaneled commissions to also examine this charge. So regardless of the fluctuation in intensity or the small nuances in the arguments of those making the apartheid charge, however, the one constant is that it is aimed at characterizing the right of Jews to sovereign equality in their historic homeland as a violation of the international legal order. The overarching political objective is to erase and subsume the nation state of the Jewish people into a single Arab state of Palestine. From the outset and through today, those promoting the apartheid narrative have made this clear. So for instance, in his report to the Human Rights Council, Michael Link characterized Zionism as settler colonialism and a covetous alien power. Nora Arakat, who worked for the NGO Badil and is currently an associate professor at Rutgers, claimed in an article published on a prominent international law blog that Zionism is built on racial self-segregation, racial exclusiveness, and racial supremacy, reviving the 1965 words of PLO propagandist Fayez Sayeg. And Tarek Bakoni, formerly of the European Council on Foreign Relations and the International Crisis Group, and currently president of the board of the Palestinian NGO Al Shabaka, wrote in a recent article that the NGO reports have the capacity to shift the narrative around Palestine in the mainstream imagination, from one focused on a conflict between two warring parties 
and on a faulty peace process to one of apartheid. All this must be done without our compromising on red lines. This is our elders' misstep. They compromised on the Palestinian thawabet or red lines accepting partition, which is the bedrock of apartheid in the name of political and diplomatic engagement. And in early March, Paul O'Brien, head of Amnesty International US, despite later and weak attempts to walk back his statements after a flood of criticism stated, we are opposed to the idea that Israel should be preserved as a state for the Jewish people. So given the clear political objective, it is therefore important to understand the history of this discourse and to push back against this egregious calumny and the efforts to instrumentalize it under the banner of human rights and international law. So to help us do, th do this today, we have three incredible experts and they'll discuss the three main junctures in the development and promotion of the apartheid charge. And they have all been extremely inf influential to me um, in researching the apartheid discourse and in, in um, authoring the two reports. I mentioned at the outset. So first we have uh, Steve, Steven Zipperstein, who is a distinguished fellow at the UCLA Center for Middle East Development. He serves as a lecturer at the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs and the UCLA Global Studies Program. He's also a lecturer in the Department of History at UC Santa Barbara and a visiting professor at Tel Aviv University Law School. And prior to teaching, Steve practiced law for nearly 40 years, including as a federal prosecutor and Justice Department official, and as the chief legal officer at Verizon Wireless and BlackBerry. He is also the author of two incredible books published by Rutledge in the past year or so on the history of the mandate period and the UN partition plan. The first, Zionism, Palestinian Nationalism and the Law. And the second book is The Law and the Arab-Israeli Conflict, The Trials of Palestine. And I really cannot recommend these works highly enough. Our second speaker is Isabella Tabarovsky, who is a senior program associate at the Kennan Institute of the Wilson Center. And she is a contributing writer at Tablet Magazine. She is a 2022 research fellow at ISCAP and a founding member of the London Center for the Study of Contemporary Anti-Semitism. Her research and writing focus is on Soviet anti-Zionism and contemporary left anti-Semitism. And last but not least, we have NGO Monitor's founder and president, Professor Gerald Steinberg. Gerald is also the Professor Emeritus at bar -Ilan University, where he founded the Program on Conflict Management and Negotiation. He is a member of the Israel Council of Foreign Affairs, appointed to the Israel Higher Education Council Committee on Public Policy, an academic participant in the Interparliamentary Coalition for Combating Anti-Semitism, and a participating member at the Halifax International Security Forum. And he is also the author of many publications and regularly appears as a commentator in major media outlets. Uh, so first, to get our discussion going, I'd like to turn to Steve. Uh, so Steve, if you could provide us with some introductory remarks and speak about how claims of settler colonialism and Jews being a foreign presence in the region permeated early legal efforts relating to the conflict. Well, thank you so much, Anne, for your very kind introduction. Pleasure to be with all of you. And just a quick disclaimer, I am a lawyer after all. I have to say I'm speaking in my personal capacity and not on behalf of UCLA in any way. Um, so let's go back um, 107 years or so when the British ambassador in Cairo, in the midst of World War I, had an exchange of letters with the great-great-grandfather of the current King of Jordan, King Abdullah II. His great-great-grandfather was the Sharif Hussein of Mecca. And in that exchange of correspondence, the British ambassador in Cairo, Sir Henry McMahon, said, look, uh, why don't you lead an Arab uprising against the Turks, who we are fighting, we Britain are fighting, in World War One, and if we win the war, when the war is over, we will guarantee Arab independence in the uh, Ottoman or Turkish regions of the Middle East, except except um, certain areas that are to the west of Syria cannot be said to be purely Arab, and that was a reference to um, what we would now call um, Israel and the West Bank, uh, and the Sharif accepted that offer. And when the war ended and everyone went to Versailles for the peace conference, the Sharif's son, whose name was Faisal, who eventually became the king of uh, Iraq, um, Faisal represented the Arabs at Versailles. And he met Chaim Weizmann, 
in January of 1919 in Versailles and signed um, a document uh, pledging uh, to recognize a Jewish, um, a Jewish homeland in Palestine, which the British, of course, had promised in 1917, November 1917, in the Balfour Declaration. And at the end of the document, in his own handwriting, Faisal said, um, my promise to the Jews is contingent on the British keeping their promise to us to give us our independence in the areas that they captured from, from Turkey after the war. Um, and a couple of months later, in March of 1919, Faisal wrote a letter to future U.S. Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter saying, we welcome the Jews back in Palestine. We welcome them home. And in late 1919, December of 1919, Faisal wrote yet another letter, this time in French, to Sir Herbert Samuel, uh, who eventually became the first British High Commissioner in Palestine, reiterating that the Arabs accepted the Jewish return to Palestine. And of course, Jews had been in Palestine uh, for centuries continually uh, after the destruction of the Second Temple in 70, the year 70 of the Common Era. Uh, the Jews maintained a continuous presence in Tzfat, in Jerusalem, in Tiberias, in Hebron. And so there were always Jews there, but the Arabs themselves welcomed more Jews coming uh, to Palestine after the war. So what happened? What changed, Dan? Well, uh, Faisal wanted to become the king of Syria. And in 1920, the French who were in possession of Syria after World War I, uh, and of course the French and British had carved at the Middle East between them in the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916, the French ejected Faisal from Syria. And eventually, as I said, he became king of Iraq. And when he was kicked out of Syria, everything changed. He and his lawyer, a very famous Palestinian lawyer named Aouni Bey Abdul Hadi, uh, began to construct the narrative of Jewish settler colonialism, Jews from Europe taking over our land. Um, and of course, what that ignored was Faisal's own acceptance of the Balfour Declaration. It ignored that Arab landowners were willingly selling their land at enormously marked up prices to Jewish buyers, uh, not just Rothschilds, but other uh, Jewish buyers from around the world who were buying uh, land from Arab sellers and compensating the Arab farmers uh, who had been working uh, those fields for a long time and finding them other, uh, other, other places to uh, where they could settle. Uh, the argument, of course, ignored that the Arabs themselves for a long time and until today say the Arabs and Jews always got along together in Palestine. We always got along until Zionism came along and the Jews wanted to create their own state, but we always got along, meaning there were always Jews here. Not that they were a foreign alien presence who came at some later point. And so this narrative began to be constructed. And I'll just say for another minute that during the late 1920s and 1930s and 1940s, there were a large number of legal type proceedings, trials and commissions and so forth, where the Arab witnesses, um, especially the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajamin al Husseini, but also the Arab lawyers, Aouni Bey Abdul Hadi, who I mentioned, would repeatedly in their testimony uh, spin this narrative, try to transform what was fundamentally a political dispute over um, who would uh, uh, be the dominant party in British Palestine or after Britain left. The dispute was constantly spun by the Arab witnesses uh, into a legal claim, a legal claim uh, that uh, Arab uh, rights were being violated, that the Balfour Je Declaration worked an injustice on the Arabs, uh, that the Arabs had some kind of uh, basis for either monetary compensation or for other legal remedies. And you see this in their testimony over and over and over and over again, whereas the British witnesses from Lloyd George, Prime Minister during World War I, David Lloyd George, Winston Churchill, who was the colonial secretary right after the war, um, British witness after British witness after British witness, Herbert Samuel, I mentioned, repeatedly testified, both publicly and in secret, that there was no Jewish settler colonial displacement of the indigenous Arab population, that there was nothing approaching South African style apartheid, and we began to hear that charge leveled. The Arabs even accused the Jews of engaging in Nazism 
in the in their testimony before the Peel Commission in 1936 and 37. All of that rejected flatly by Churchill and the other British witnesses who reiterated that uh, that Chaim Weizmann and the Jewish people had helped Britain in World War I, that Britain was recognizing the historic Jewish connection to Palestine, as did the League of Nations when they issued the British Mandate for Palestine. The preamble to the League of Nations Mandate for Palestine expressly says that the purpose of creating a Jewish national home in Palestine is to reconstitute, not constitute, reconstitute the historic Jewish presence in the land. So I'll stop there. I've got more to say later, but I'll stop there, Anne. Thank you very much. Thank you. That This history has really been forgotten or was never known. And it, and it, and it really, um, the whole settler colonial narrative really underpins the apartheid narrative. And so it's so important, you know, the work you've been doing and the research and, and really, you know, making people familiar again with this history that, that's really been lost history. Um, so we'll definitely get back to it, um, but I want to turn now to Isabella, because um, the next play, main player that really um, joined this, this apartheid discourse were the Soviets and their propaganda campaign against Zionism. So Isabella, if you could talk to us about that and how that developed in the 1960s and 70s. So thank you so much for uh, having me. And um, so uh, I wanna say very briefly that the Bolsheviks and the Soviets were always opponents of Zionism as an expression of Jewish nationalism and sense of self-determination. So starting from Lenin, continuing through Stalin, Khrushchev and Brezhnev, and, and each had their own specific political reasons. I'm not gonna go into details on all of it. I would just say that only at the beginning during Lenin's times, that uh, this rejection of Zionism actually had something to do with socialist internationalism. There were, there were more complex reasons for that, but if that were a point, it was only true really then. After that, already starting with Stalin, the reasons for opposing Zionism were different. And I'll mention what happened with Stalin because this question very often comes up, is that even though Stalin initially supported the establishment of the state of Israel, the support really had nothing to do with the belief that the Jewish people deserved a state of their own and they had a right to their own self-determination. It had everything to do with uh, foreign policy, strategic considerations, a hope of establishing a toehold in the Middle East in order to oppose the British and the French and ultimately the Americans there. Um, and then, and, and that very quickly turns uh, because once the state is established, and especially when Golda Meir visits, visits the Soviet Union in 48, it becomes very apparent to Stalin. Well, first of all, it becomes apparent that Israel is not going with the Soviet Union. It's not going to be in the socialist camp. But he also realizes that there is basically, he has a fifth column on his hands, quote unquote, because Soviet Jews were so excited about the Jewish state they were so excited when Golda Meir came to the Soviet Union that it really triggers the paranoia. And this, this kind of, this, this paranoia plays very much into the anti-Semitic campaigns that took place in the last several years of Stalin's life. In these campaigns, accusations of Zionist leanings and spying on behalf of Zionist networks were consistently present. It's often forgotten, but the doctors plot that anti-cosmopolitan campaign, they had these elements there. Okay, so and then in the late 1950s, the Soviets do establish a presence in the Middle East. Uh, they become a patron of Egypt. They train the Egyptian army. They do the same with the rest of the Arab Middle East. So it's much more than a toehold, right? The Soviet Union becomes a very important player in the Middle East. And they're now clearly on the, on the opposite side from Israel. So then I'm skipping through a lot of history, but then comes 1967, the Six Day War. So Israel's victory in this war came as a shock to the Soviets because, again, they had trained all those Arab armies. They were certain that they would win. And, and then this crushing defeat, it creates a massive crisis in the socialist bloc. Um, and the crisis, among other things, generates a sense of a need for a propaganda strategy that would help the Soviet Union save face on the one hand, and on the other, help them in their counteroffensive. And so they begin to develop a really complex framework that paints Zionists and Israel as the most evil force on the planet. Now, they don't begin in 67. A lot of the history that I skipped, that's when some of the kind of strands of that begin to come together. Some of it, by the way, 
um, I believe that what Stephen has just talked about possibly comes from there because what, what happens in 67, 68, 69 is that the Soviets develop this kind of unified vision of what Zionism is about, in which they equate Zionism with Nazism and fascism and racism and apartheid and settler colonialism. Uh, Zionism is a tool of imperialism and it really represents every evil under the sun. So I don't think the more I do this research, the more I believe and Steve, what Stephen just said actually confirms this to me is that they didn't invent all of these ideas themselves. In fact, if you read Robert Wistrich, for those who are academically minded, he actually mentions that the British Foreign Office had people in it already in the 30s during the mandate time who, uh, who equated Zionism with Nazism. So, but what the Soviets did, their big uh, achievement was to pull all of this together into a single kind of picture. And I think what's really important here is that they really were guided specifically by the anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. This is what their sort of anti-Zionism was based on. I have a paper that's coming out soon where it's all really been researched, there's scholarship on it, but I just wrote a paper where I pull all of this together. The people who created all this for the Soviets, I mean, the need and the guidance emanated from the KGB through the Central Committee of the Communist Party. There were special groups in that. But there was a particular group of people, call them thought leaders, quote unquote, who really pulled all of this together. So it was a set of individuals. There were maybe a dozen and a half of them or so. Uh, who who developed the nuts and bolts of this framework. They came to be known as Zionologists. And so while the Soviets continued to be guided overtly by the Marxist-Leninist framework, overtly a left-wing, right, kind of far-left uh, framework, members of this group were actually members of this nationalist patriotic movement that developed in the USSR in the 1950s. And some were really far, far right-wingers, literally to the point of admiring Hitler and Nazi Germany, they were personally anti-Semitic. They read the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which were officially prohibited in the Soviet Union, but that were read widely among the communist elites. Some were admirers of Hitler. Some were Arabists who served in the Middle East in, in Soviet embassies. And so they picked up strands of Arab thought and Arab anti-Semitism. Some of the things, again, that I think Stephen mentioned, some of the ideas that were already emanating from the Arab circles at the time, that Zionists were racist and that they were settler colonialists who were trying to take away um, the Arab land from them. I think they would have been able to pick them up there. And, and the, the biggest contribution of these individuals, of this group of Zionologists, was to pull it, put it all together and express it in a language that was acceptable to the global left, right? So even though they themselves were right wing, they couldn't express it in the kind of fascist slash kind of nationalist patriotic language that they themselves adhered to, right? They had to express it in the official language of the Soviet uh, kind of philosophy. And so you have the, the book here that, is really important is uh, uh, Beware Zionism or Caution Zionism. So it was written by one of these people. Uh, it's available in, in English, although I think it's hard to find. So, uh, so part of that whole framework was that Zionists were racists, that, they were, that Zionism was akin to South African racism, that, it that they were perpetrating apartheid against Palestinians. And all of this became kind of part and parcel of that thought. Now, uh, I don't know if I have another minute or two, I just want to say a couple of words about how it all uh, penetrated or was con communicated to the West because I think it's really important. So, so the Soviets had a very widespread propaganda apparatus that allowed them to communicate these messages throughout the world in dozens of languages. They had broadcasting capacity, they, they owned um, certain publications, in, again, in every language in the world. They also had close relationships. They, they, they uh, formed and cultivated relationships with local media. Uh, they placed editorials in major newspapers around the world. We have evidence of them placing, even managing to place uh, editorials and columns in places like the New York Times, where they equated, for example, Zionism with uh, Nazism and, uh, and racism. They worked via embassies. Again, we just, we have evidence for all of it. Uh, they worked through leftist parties, which they financed. Uh, first and foremost, communist parties, but not only. Uh, really, anybody who was willing to kind of support the Soviet agenda more broadly became part of this circle, which they 
they financed and, and they return in return, they expected an ideological conformity and the participation in the anti-Zionist campaign was a crucial part of it. So they organized press conferences where they had their speakers. They also used international scholarly conferences to communicate their ideas. So essentially, after 1967, they basically tried to turn every major international event, and this will sound familiar to us, every major international event in which they participated into a mass demonstration of solidarity with the Arab peoples and a denunciation of Israel's aggression. Uh, they sponsored the adoption of various resolutions. They, of course, were very um, uh, dominant in various international organizations. They ran their own organizations, and so they sponsored various resolutions. Uh, where Zionism was presented again as racist and apartheid and, and all of it. A lot of times they segmented their messages. So a lot of times the message about apartheid and racism was primarily directed to African countries where the Soviets waged their own kind of separate struggle for dominance against, uh, against America and the West. Uh, so, so this was, um, oh, then they used Jews also widely, Jews and Israelis to communicate their points. So it was a truly widespread system. Of, of which the accusations of apartheid and racism were one part. And of course, the Soviets sponsored the UN, the infamous UN resolution, but they introduced that language to the UN already in 1965. Uh, so I think I'll stop here and then answer whatever other questions we have. Okay, great. Yeah, it's a really critical moment in history because the Soviets really did allow these messages originating from the Arab leadership to disseminate it worldwide and then bring the other, you know, the African countries and other, um, the uh, Soviet bloc online. And so I think then really the next critical junction is the Durban conference in 2001, because we have, you know, for a good 20 years, things were kind of, you know, moving along. And then you had the peace process in the nineties, sort of seemed to put a damper a bit on the discourse. Um, so, Gerald, why don't I turn it over to you and, and to talk about what happened in 2001 and how everything changed. And Okay. Well, first of all, I, <clears throat> I enjoyed hearing both the other presentations, both Stephen and Isabella, and I'll continue. I will, uh, uh, full, full disclosure, I'm not a lawyer, neither am I a Soviet expert. I study politics and I look at the political processes that are involved, the power, the interests, ideology, and I think we see all of these things coming together. So we jump from 1975, we have the infamous UN Zionism as Racism General Assembly Resolution, which uh, I remember and others may remember that uh, the, uh, the Israeli ambassador to the UN at the time, Mr. Herzog, ripped up on the podium and declared it null and void. In 1991, the US, the, one of the conditions that Israel uh, demanded from the United States and from the United Nations in terms of the uh, war against uh, Iraq, against Saddam Hussein after he invaded Kuwait and Israel staying back was to uh, rescind that resolution and it was rescinded. However, the resolution that came immediately afterwards, the, com the Committee on the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People, that was the resolution that came immediately after Zionism's racism in 1975, was never rescinded. And it's still, still going full blast. So we have 1991, that resolution is rescinded. And then 2001, we have the, the Dur September, early September, late August, we have the Durban conference. What happened there? What happened in those 10 years that led to the, uh, the, the unrescinding or the rebirth, the revival of the same type of uh, very poisonous demonization of Israel through the apartheid uh, label? through the analogy with, with South Africa. It's important to remember that Durban, the place where this conference took place is in South Africa. The conference was conceived a few years before, a big UN conference to celebrate the end of the uh, apartheid regime in South Africa. And it became hijacked. This is something I've written so much about that I have to be careful and limit this to just the highlights of a few minutes. But the process by which it became hijacked really is symbolic and provides us with the understanding of where we are now. We're now 21 years later, and the same organizations and individuals that engineered the hijacking of Durban from the beginning. It didn't happen in Durban. It didn't happen on August 29, 2001. It happened at least a year earlier, maybe two years earlier, when 
there was a preparatory conference that was decided to be take place in, in Tehran. It actually took place in February of 2001. Once they agreed that there would be a preparatory conference in, in Tehran, it was going to be inevitable that that became then the vehicle for demonizing Israel. And because of the connections with South Africa, the apartheid uh, label was a very convenient uh, way of doing that. There had been some preliminary aspects. That's when I discovered the massive world and the destructive world of, of NGOs, particularly of organizations that call themselves human rights organizations, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty. Human Rights Watch was at the time already headed by Ken Roth. Ken Roth still, we're now, uh, he became head of, of Human Rights Watch in 1993. And it's now almost 30 years, almost his 30th, 30th year anniversary. And the demonization of Israel is the anti-Israel ideology, partly post-colonialism, but also I think has to be described or understood from a personal perspective. Otherwise, it's very hard to understand. He took Human Rights Watch and brought in other people and led it through. I saw the signs of this. I happened to go to other conferences where there were already booths that were using the language that we see now. This was in, in around 1999 and to, particularly 2000 at the beginning of the, when the violence grew and the attacks against Israel grew. And I would go to a conference in Geneva on completely different topics and see these booths by NGOs. That became a massive assault at the Durban conference. And what's important to understand is, first of all, it was primarily based inside the NGO forum. It was led by, that was the engine for all this, 5,000 delegates, 1,500 organizations in which Human Rights Watch and Amnesty, plus the Palestinian groups like al Haq and their um, allies, determined the agenda, controlled the events, shut down speakers, including Ann Bayevsky and others who did not subscribe to the Zionism is racism as apartheid uh, party line. And there at Durban, at the NGO a forum, that's where the plan of action and the um, final declaration specifically referred a number of places to Israel as an apartheid state. They also had ethnic cleansing and genocide and war crimes, but the word apartheid kept reappearing. And then the most important, the action item was the complete international isolation of Israel as an apartheid state. There's a myth that somewhere around 2004, 2005, there was a Palestinian call that led to the BDS movement, Omar Baghouti. That's a myth. Anybody who was either watching what happened at Durban or familiar with the process sees that at Durban itself, that language and that plan of action was adopted. That's the beginning of BDS. They took all of the uh, tools, all of the techniques, all of the soft war, as we call it now, uh, capabilities, that they was used against the South African apartheid and said, now we're gonna turn it against Israel. This was a conscious political decision. The language that we're seeing now, the reports from Human Rights Watch, Human Rights Watch said, this is a new set of events. We didn't call it apartheid before. And now this was with a report of April, 2021. Well, that's nonsense. It's completely, I'll, I'll say, I could call it a lie. It's a historical, whatever you wanna use because they already said that in 2001 at Durban and before Durban and during Durban and after Durban and continuously they've used that language. So what we saw for the reasons that you Anne explained was that it became again, three or four years ago, it was time to have another wave saying the same things, producing more reports. And now they can use different kinds of social media. They have Twitter, which they didn't have in 2001 and other vehicles for doing this but it's really the same form of poisonous demonization of Israel. They don't think they cared very much about it. They looked for the, the um, facade of the legal argument. This is, a, as I said, I don't come from a legal background. I think that this was predetermined. They're gonna throw some legal language in. They're gonna create these uh, definitions and you can fool some of the people some of the time and all the people some of the time, et cetera. So they got Human Rights Watch, and it's important to mention, $129 million annual, million dollar annual budget. A huge amount of that went into this campaign. And so yes, they got their coverage in the New York Times. They played the game, the embargo game. It's clear, so here we are now a year later, that the reporters, the journalists, that wrote about this report and gave it credibility, and they had then a couple of quotes on the Israeli government and other people to say, well, it's wrong but they had no idea what, what, what to even look at and to, to see how completely absurd this report was. And then Amnesty rehashed it 
Again, a lot of the same terms, including, I think it's Jewish domination, whereas Human Rights Watch talked about Jewish supremacy, but it's basically the same thing. It's a cut and paste, and they talked about the law of return as an example of uh, the apartheid, right? Israel gives preference to Jews, and France gives preference to French people, and Germans give preference to people who come from the nation state, have connections with the nation state, have preferred treatment. But for Israel, that's apartheid. It's not apartheid in Ireland or Germany or any other country. It's only for Israel. And I think that's the point that the singling out of Israel, the focus, the obsessive focus on Israel and using whatever happens to work. Amnesty, uh, Human Rights Watch, uh, Haq, B'Tselem, they pick the apartheid theme. That's the theme for all the reasons you mentioned, including the International Criminal Court. And the work that you've done particularly is very important, you and Josh Kern, is important to take apart, to dissect the claims that are made for those of the people who would even give this credibility. So the question is whether, in fact, we will be able to uh, push back on this, stem the tide, or whether the, the and they, uh, Michael Lynch, of course, the, all of the uh, UN Human Rights Council uh, usual characters and uh, their supporting actors all are acting, acting as an echo chamber. Question is, whether the pushback, and I think we are seeing strong pushback, particularly from groups like the ADL and the American Jewish Community, those that have significant power to push back against these kinds of massive budgets. I should say also Amnesty's budget is on the order of 350 million euros a year. And these are massive, massive organizations totally obsessed by Israel and using the apartheid vehicle. That's, I think, the main point that I would like to, to get across, that this is really a farce and needs to be treated as such. Thanks, Gerald. I want to uh, touch on a point you raised about how Israel's uh, Jewish state is uniquely singled out as being illegal as a form of apartheid, as opposed to the you know dozens of Christian states and the you know nearly sixty Arab states and Muslim states. And so I want to I want to turn back to Steve. Um, if you could, so if you could talk a little bit about around the uh, what the international, how the international community really endorsed the idea of a Jewish state. I mean, this is something that was endorsed in international law, and so for today, for all of these groups, and really throughout the entire time this discourse is being used to say that there's something illegal about a Jewish state uniquely, uh, really does not reflect you know, even the, the views of the international community from the very outset. So if, if you could talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Um, so let's go back 102 years. Uh, right after the Treaty of Versailles, the victorious Allied powers gathered together at a conference in San Remo, Italy, um, where they uh, endorsed the Balfour Declaration. And as I said, the League of Nations, the League of Nations, uh, issued the mandate for Palestine to Britain. And as I said, the preamble to the mandate, as well as the various operative articles in the mandate, all incorporate the Balfour Declaration. The preamble recognizes, as I said, the historic connection of the Jewish people to Israel. Uh, and the mandate requires Britain to um, create a Jewish national home in Palestine to facilitate Jewish immigration and close settlement on the land. This is an international legal instrument adopted by the entire international community. And Britain's boss at the League of Nations was called the Permanent Mandates Commission, which every year would bring British officials to Geneva and grill them. What are you doing to make sure that the Jewish national home is being established? And it's remarkable to see how pro-Zionist the League of Nations was in the 1920s and 1930s in complete contrast, completely the opposite to the anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist United Nations that we see today. Um, in 1939, you all remember the infamous British white paper that was issued on May 17, 1939, that cut off, all but cut off Jewish immigration from Europe to Palestine. The white paper though, a lot of people forget, had another set of provisions that provided that after a 10 year period, Palestine, would be removed from British control and gain independence under majority rule, meaning that Palestine would become, all of Palestine, all of it, would become a majority Arab ruled country. And what did the Arabs say in response to that 
amazing offer. You talk about the deal of the century. That was the deal of the 20th century for the Palestinian Arabs. They rejected it. Why did they reject it? Because they didn't want to wait 10 years for independence and they didn't want a single additional Jew to be allowed into the country. Go to 1947. Isabella talked about this. Anne mentioned it. The United Nations, after World War II, again, the entire international community, votes on November 29, 1947, to offer the two-state solution. The very solution that the PLO claims it wants today was offered to them in 1947, by the way, with a lot more land than the Palestinians want today for their state. The Jews accepted the two-state solution, which provided also that Jerusalem would not be the capital. Jerusalem would be held separately as a separate body, a corpus separatum under international rule. The Jews said, okay, we'll take it. Not perfect, but we'll take it. What did the Palestinians do? The next day, November 30th, they started a civil war. And then when the Jews declared independence, when Britain left on May 14th, 1948, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, all invaded. Egypt bombed Tel Aviv the next day, May 15th, 1948. Fast forward to 1964, the founding of the PLO. Remember, between 1949 and 1967, the West Bank was under Jordanian control. Gaza was under Egyptian control. Not once in those 18 years did the Palestinians ever demand statehood. Not once. And in May of 1964, when the PLO was created, its founding charter, the PLO Covenant, in Article 24, says expressly, we do not claim jurisdiction, we do not claim sovereignty over the West Bank or Gaza. And why did they say that? Because the Palestine that they wanted to liberate was known as the State of Israel. And so how do we go from the repeated historical rejections by the Arabs of every single offer made to them for statehood? How do we go from that to the claim that they're victims of apartheid? And the reason for that, and I'll just be very quick here, <clears throat> is that, and Isabella outlined this perfectly as did Gerald, um, there is a concept in academic literature called intersectionality linking together the civil rights struggles, the national liberation movements, the, uh, the fight against settler colonialism. And so under the theory of intersectionality, the, for example, the civil rights movement in the United States and the Palestinian Arab desire for statehood are part and parcel of the same phenomenon. They're the same thing. And the crown jewel of intersectionality is apartheid. If you can make the case that Israel is practicing apartheid against the Palestinian Arabs in the same way that the South African, um, um, that, the, that, 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 that the white governments of South Africa, that the Afrikaners practiced apartheid against the indigenous black people in South Africa. If you can make that intersectional linkage, then you've just won the grand prize. And that, as we've heard from other, our other speakers, is exactly what the Soviet Union and the NGOs have been aiming for for decades. And they're getting closer and closer and closer. Part of it is because people like Jimmy Carter and John Kerry have used the word apartheid to describe Israel. Part of it is also because, uh, and I don't want to attack people personally, but people like Ken Roth, people like Peter Beinart, and other Jews, American Jews, have also embraced the intersectionality narrative around apartheid and Israel. Anybody who knows anything about the history of South Africa, even a scintilla about South Africa, knows that this is absolute nonsense, complete garbage. But the, the combination of, as I said earlier, Framing the narrative around the Palestinian struggle as part of the global human rights, global civil rights, global opposition to colonialism, and as a legal matter where they are victims of injustice entitled to a remedy. 
That's what's driving this. And to me, if you look at the history, if you look at the history, what is so ironic about this is that the Palestinian case, as a matter of law, is unbelievably weak. Why is it weak? Because they repeatedly rejected and turned down and waived. We all know the concept of waiver. They waived every offer that was ever made to them for statehood. And they have to live with the consequences of those waivers. Are they entitled to their own state as a matter of politics? That's up to the diplomats. That's up to the diplomats to decide, not the lawyers, not the judges, not the International Criminal Court, not the International Court of Justice. Their legal case is incredibly weak. If they want to come to the table and join their Arab brethren in the Gulf, become part of the Abraham Accords, and share in the wealth that the Abraham Accords will create for the people in the region, then they can do it tomorrow. They can do it tonight if they want to. So I'll stop there, Anne. Thank you. Thanks. That was very powerful. <laughs> um, but I will. I want to turn to Isabella too to just also talk about why. And I, you know, Stephen touched on this, but I think also, do, do you see why is the Soviet propaganda still being repeated today? You know, the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, it was discredited. So why is it that these human rights, these groups that proclaim to promote human rights were adopting this very anti-human rights propaganda? What, like, what do you think motivates them today to continue to use that type of discourse? Well, first of all, I mean, this is, of course, the a big question that I think mystifies a lot of us. And uh, my theory is that I think the left began to adopt these ideas already in the 70s and the 80s that we can see in some of the things that emanated from the British left in particular in the 70s and 80s, certainly from the American US, uh, CPUSA, Communist Party of the USA, right? So, so already that these ideas become part and parcel of the discourse. And I think that at some point, the next generations of the left, they don't anymore kind of adopted from the Soviet Union, as you say, it falls apart, it's not there anymore, but it's already part of the global kind of leftist discourse. And I think that for a while, this discourse was probably kind of confined more to the, to the margins and didn't enter the mainstream. Uh, what we see now is the discourse being kind of entering the mainstream. And I think we can speculate as to why that is. Uh, I think the, the, the answer is probably pretty wide and broad. But I also think that this, wh whoever is kind of pushing these ideas, I think does it, does it out of a recognition that this propaganda is extremely effective. I mean, is as, um, as, I mean, it truly is grounded in conspiracy theory. I think those of us who saw the interview that the amnesty officials gave in Israel to Times of Israel as they were representing, as they were presenting their report, I mean, that interview was just filled with conspiracy tropes, right? Like Israel is never doing anything for a simple reason that it think it's, thinks it's the best policy or because it's a democratic state and it's a complex democratic state. No, it does everything because it's trying to conceal its sinister nature and its evil nature. And, and I think it's it's ultimately uh, just an extremely effective form. I think a lot of uh, a lot of people are drawn to this kind of conversation, this kind of framework. It's just like a classic conspiracy theory, right? It explains the entirety of the world in very simple terms, and this form of anti-Zionist discourse is very much grounded in conspiracy theory. So I think it's effective, uh, and people see that it's effective. It helps them raise money. It helps them achieve certain goals, attract voters or con constituents and supporters. And so why would they give it up? And can I just expand on that a little bit? Sure, sure. The, the, you and I have talked about this in the office. We're both working and that's the issue of post-colonial ideology. I think it, it ties into the intersectionality. I would say, and Steve, you may know more about this than I do. I would say it was a precursor that post-colonialism, which, I know about it from the, it goes back, that's certainly part of the, the Soviet bloc and also the non-aligned movement uh, back in the, the 70s, even before the 60s and 70s. They talked a lot about the West being responsible for all the evils of the world. The victims of colonialism 
can't possibly be guilty of war crimes or can't it's also a, a form of um the the uh was it the subtle racism of denying agency to uh people like the palestinians so you can't blame the palestinians for having missed opportunities because they're victims of colonialism it was a little harder to say that before 67 after 67 it became very easy but post-colonialism and i see that in the writings the publications and the statements uh, writings may be too strong a term of a lot of people in the major NGO community, and particularly, and then we don't name names, but I think in this case it's relevant to talk about Ken Roth and others. Particularly, there was the group at Human Rights Watch who pushed in that direction already back in, in the, uh, the the early '90s and built on this framework, which which Isabella had talked about. So you have this the Soviet ideology, and then you have post-colonialism, which is closely allied with. Uh, they were not, I, I'm not sure that, that they were part of that they would buy on to all of the ideology, probably not. But in terms of post-colonialism and, and saying these are all victims and the aggressors, the West and the West, United, you know, Israel is part of the West. Israel is using American weapons. Israel is the leading edge of Western colonialism in, in the Middle East. You hear that language all the time. So I think that's another important element that is, now it's called intersectionality. And yes, everybody who's allegedly suffering from various kinds of uh, discrimination. Uh, it's, I think that the issue of racism when you're discuss, discussing uh, Israeli-Palestinian issues is, is uh, completely absurd, but they, they managed to shove it in and uh, it becomes accepted. So I don't know, again, it's one of those questions, how do you appeal to college students in their uh, undergraduate years who don't have a very detailed, sophisticated understanding, but say, well, Israel is very powerful, look at all these terrible things that we see that they're doing, and we, we blame Israel, and we, we adopt we Black Lives Matter and other parts of the intersectionality we're going to agree to bring into that, this whole Israel slash apartheid um, meme or theme that comes part of, that is part of the package. And, and Gerald, could you also, so the other, the other question I wanted to ask you is specifically was, what, what is Europe's role in this? Because a lot of the Palestinian NGOs, for instance, that have been pushing this campaign for many years, um, are the campaigns are being funded by the EU and European governments? So like, why, why on earth would they be funding these uh, campaigns that go completely against their policies? Well, it just so happens that I published an article about this a few months ago, which details it, this, and it's always the same NGOs, always the same. In other words, it's not well. We're going to have a call for proposals. They have this formal framework where you have to uh, submit a call for getting a grant and then a committee has to sit and has to approve and then it has to be a contract all that stuff but it's always the same 10 palestinian groups sometimes 12 and the same roughly the same number of israeli groups that get it every year for many years and from european europeans fund 80 percent in many cases of the fund of the uh, grants that allow these organizations to function precisely on these agendas so you ask why and that's an interesting question which I think has a number of, like anything else in, in, that's in the real world, it has, it's complicated, right? There are different factors. So I would say briefly, first of all, the same ideology and approach appeal to small groups of people. You see it particularly with the church links back in the, also in the 60s and 70s, that you would get liberation churches. It didn't catch on as quickly in the United States, but in Europe it caught on and the churches were officially, and that's a major difference, the church groups, the international aid church groups, humanitarian church groups, Christian aid in Britain and Missouri in, in Germany and, and each European government, Norway, Sweden, all the way down to Spain, each government funds a, an official church. We, we always hear that Israel, because it's a Jewish state, is apartheid, but that there are 28 European countries that in various forms have established churches. That's that's OK. That's we can go in that. That's a a separate issue but the point is they made the alliances and it was also very often christian palestinians and you had individuals back in the late 70s already with legal backgrounds who saw this as a very efficient way of gaining support for their cause getting a foothold and also getting funding that's the beginning of al haq law in the service of man and what it was called and there, there's a a strange uh history but there's a little bit of that information and lots of other information. So I think that there is a process that went on that in which these groups and their ideology of the demonization of Israel in different forms, that Israel is a immoral entity per se, 
not of its policies, but because it is Israel, a Jewish state is evil, appealed to important Christian segments of the liberation, the more uh, slash progressive, but also classical anti-Semitic individuals and frameworks within across Europe. And then they were able to convert that into getting funding, first for individual events, and then standard grants that became, and the bottom line is, in my view, it's very much built in to the European political system. Every year, the same calls for proposals end up with the same results. Why? Because these are their allies, their subcontractors. Israel is too strong. That's the standard European policy. How do we get to two-state two solution? Again, this is the myth, the policy, the slogans. We have to weaken Israel, strengthen the Palestinians. How do we do that? We go to the International Criminal Court. We go to the UN Human Rights Council. We use all these, and of course, the media and all sorts of other vehicles to weaken Israel and strengthen the Palestinians. How do we do that? The NGOs play a very central role. So I think it's built in. It's not questioned. And to be fair, in many cases, it's not even understood. They just go ahead and, and approve, sign the checks, and approve the same frameworks year after year after year. The purpose of writing this paper was to try to show them how blind and, and completely counterproductive, even for their own goals, this policy is. So our, our time is growing short. So I, I wanted, and I think a lot of your remarks have already touched on the questions that have been in the Q&A for the most part. So I guess I just want to close, I guess, if, if you could each make some concluding remarks and then maybe also um, talk about what you think can be done to push against this charge. Because what's interesting is geopolitically, Israel is in a much stronger state than it was obviously 70 years ago. And you know, Steve mentioned the Abraham Accords uh, and also Israel's, you know, Israel's an observer to the African Union. It's getting much stronger um, links. It's much less isolated than it used to be. Um, so I guess sort of what, what do you think is a way to, um, push back against this charge? Do you think this charge will have hold? What could the implications be? So we'll start with us, Steve. Okay, well, I'll just say quickly, and there was a great question. Uh, what can we, how do we refute this comparison or this charge of apartheid? I would say four things. Number one, <clears throat> um, look at the um, composition of the Israeli Knesset. Um, what do we have now, 14, 15, uh, Arabs in the Knesset. That never occurred in South Africa, of course. Number two, the Israeli government. There is an Arab cabinet minister. Uh, the Minister of Regional Affairs is an Arab. The South, South Africa never had uh, black members in its uh, cabinet, ever. Number three, many, many African countries have diplomatic relations with Israel. If Israel were an apartheid state like South Africa, there would be no such diplomatic relations whatsoever. Um, there would be no embassies. There would be no ambassadors. Nothing. Uh, so, you know, I trust the judgment of Nigeria far more than I trust the judgment of an NGO in Europe or, or Peter Beinart or Ken Roth. Um, and then number four, again, I'll go back to the Abraham Accords. Um, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, Sudan, not just sort of doing it for, for PR purposes, but we now have defense agreements signed between Israel uh, and uh, two or three of those countries. We have, what, 250,000 Israelis went to the United Arab Emirates last year. Deals are being signed on a daily basis. There's an incredible amount of commerce, economic development. If, if those countries felt that Israel were engaging in apartheid against the Palestinians, does anybody in their right mind think that they would have willingly normalized relations and not just normalized, but actually breathing life into them with commercial and defense ties? So to me, I think it'd be great, concrete suggestion for uh, NGO Monitor, create a one page side by side comparison. This was South Africa, this is Israel. Nope, there is nothing in common between them. And let's get that out to all of us on this webinar and I'll distribute it to my students at UCLA, especially the Jewish students who are the ones who, are, who feel guilty and who are embarrassed and who are upset when they go around campus and they hear all of the other student organizations slamming Israel for being part of the anti-civil rights movement and, and delegitimizing Israel. I want to give the Jewish kids on campus, I want to arm them with the facts so that they can respond when they hear this garbage that's being spewed. We've got to focus on our own people first. 
and pry them away from from this nonsense, and then we can spread out uh, to the to the broader non-Jewish community. But we've got to take care of the Jewish kids first, who are growing up with a terrible lack of understanding about this. Thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I've been thinking this whole issue is really a, a moment where we really can start re-educating people about Zionism because that really was lost over the past, you know, 20, 30 years. So we can sort of take this horrible, you know, discourse that's rearing its ugly head again as a as an opportunity, really. Uh, so Isabella, I'll, I'll turn to you. So first of all, I think it's really crucial for us to be uh, pushing about it, uh, to be pushing against it. I actually, I'm gonna make a, a connection that may seem um, strange, but it isn't to me. Um, you know, I think we've all seen how Russia has weaponized the charge of Nazism against Ukrainians um, over the past uh, month and use it as an excuse to start a war against Ukraine. It's important to understand that Russia has been demonizing Ukrainians as Nazis and fascists for the last eight years. Uh, and in fact, it actually goes even further back also to, so it's the same kind of Soviet patterns um, of, of thought and demonization. But demonizing a country and a people for eight years in a row opens the door to violence, right? It opens the door to war and to what we're, we're hearing today about mass atrocities. So I think that demonization of Israel and Zionists, we know it, ha it has led to, to death and violence in the past, and it will continue to do so the more it continues. And crucially, I think that this kind of demonization, this is what Soviet history also shows, is that, look, all of this conversation about Zionism and demonization of Zionism in Israel in Soviet times, that is what created the anti-Semitic atmosphere in the country that forced Jews to rethink their future in the country and want to emigrate. So if diaspora Jews think that they will sit this out, they're really wrong. I mean, this is gonna be directed at them as well. So I think that it's really crucial for sure that we address it. How we do it is complex. I mean, look, I look at this as a historian and, and I think that it's, you know, it's hard to put it into simple talking points, but for example, this, this idea that I mentioned that these, that this whole Soviet anti-Zionist propaganda was actually under the auspices of left-wing discourse. It was created by people who were actually far, far right-wing, right, of fascist views themselves, neo-Nazi views themselves. These people who created this anti-Zionist propaganda for the left, after the Soviet Union fell apart, they went, they went on to found fascist parties inside Russia, neo-Nazi parties inside Russia. So the very same language that is being used on the left today has also been used by the Russian far right. And so it's no wonder that sometimes we feel like, well, you know, we're listening to the far left, but we're actually hearing far right ideas. Well, it's all part of a piece. So I think that there is something about indicating these connections and doing it in a clear kind of way and showing the connection with the conspiracy theory, addressing the irrationality of it all. I think that perhaps there is something that we can create out of that that can help us fight it. I think it's an important part of it. Yeah, that's so important. And, and thank you so much for, you know, raising, you know, what's going on in Ukraine now and, and the connections with the Soviet propaganda in that case to what we're seeing in our case with, with the apartheid charge and also how it leads to violence, how we saw last week, you know, from incitements, you know, 11 Israelis were murdered, but also we've been seeing, you know, violence rising against Jews in the diaspora. And as you, as you so importantly pointed out, um, you know, I, that really, I think, is the main goal of a lot of these reports. It's targeting the diaspora and to weaken, and as Steve pointed out, to weaken their connections to Israel and to, and their connections to Judaism. That's the real target. It's less Israel. Like Israel's doing okay, but it, it's these diaspora communities that, that are really going to suffer from this. And, and I think that was so apparent in the comments of the head of the Amnesty Director for the United States, you know, where he's invoking supposed polls involving Jews and, and castigating American Jews to support his, his, you know, offensive claim that there should not be a Jewish state. So I, I thank you again for really raising those points. And, uh, and so, Gerald, I'll, I'll turn to you to close us out. I'll just say that I agree with everything that both of you said, or all three of you said. I also think that making this 
video available. This this discussion, I think, will help for those who are going to spend some time to get into it. We could even do set, bits and pieces and segments of it. I think Steve's point about first we have to deal with the Jewish students, the Jewish community, so they understand what the issue is because they're poorly educated. They don't know the details. I would guess that if you say to them San Remo, most of them will roll their eyes and have no idea what you're talking about, the whole history. Balfour Declaration, even in many cases, all of that. And I think also the Soviet, the, I think, Isabella, your caricatures, the caricatures you have from the Soviet Union, from the anti-Zionist ones, and you compare that to the language that's used by Amnesty and Human Rights Watch and the Hum Human Rights Council, I think that's very powerful because it really projects, it shows, don't buy into this, people. All of these things, I think, are important. The, the one-page comparison is important. And I think we also have to continue to hit at the fact that these organizations are not what they claim to be at all, that they are propaganda groups. They each, for, the, for their for similar or different reasons, have targeted Israel and, the, and Jewish rights uh, extensively and uh, very much obsessively. We need to repeat those things over and over again. And I think that's, that's just the best way to go about doing this. So I wanna thank you all uh, so much for speaking with us today. I mean, we could have spoken for another hour. I mean, it's so important to discuss these aspects, um, but we have, to, we have to end here, uh, but to be continued. And I look forward to reading everyone's you know, upcoming works and uh, continuing the discussion that way. So uh, thank you again and have a great day. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.